I see drunk people. <laughs> They're everywhere, in bars, on the streets, and at work, especially at work, in one of the busiest ERs in Southern California. As an emergency physician, I'm married to drunks the way a plumber is married to leaky pipes. <laughs> My mentor in residency warned me, Jay, there are two populations of patients who are put on this earth to fool you, geriatrics and drunks. <laughs> and it's true. I've had old people in the midst of a heart attack not complain of chest pain or any symptoms at all. Drunks with bleeding in their brain who deny headaches and have no recollection of falling. Not only are they more prone to injury and illness, but they often don't have the cognitive wherewithal to help doctors clue in on the problem, which is why malpractice lawyers love them. <laughs> like ice cream at Baskin Robbins, drunks come to the ER in 31 different flavors. <laughs> Some arrive comatose, others are loud and obnoxious. Some are funny and flamboyant, while others are agitated and aggressive. John arrived in my ER, quiet and calm. He was 32 years old with dark hair and a youthful face. When the medics lowered their gurney, he stood up, walked slowly to the hospital bed, and laid down. The paramedic said, his girlfriend called 911 because he's been drinking more, and she's concerned he's depressed. I introduced myself and stood next to his bed. How much did you have to drink? A few beers, he said. The stench of fermented yeast trailing those words raised some doubts. <laughs> Quick ER math takes the amount a patient tells you, multiply it by five, <laughs> add a couple if they live in Santee. <laughs> and that comes pretty close to the actual amount. Did you pass out or fall? No. Are you hurt anywhere? No. Have you been feeling depressed? No. Have you had thoughts of hurting yourself? No. He wasn't much for a conversation, so I performed an exam. Satisfied that there weren't any injuries, I said, let's keep you here a little longer. We'll give you some IV fluids, run some tests, and then I left the room. His nurse Sherry came up to me about an hour later to notify me that he wanted to leave. When I went back into the room, he pleaded, Doc, just let me go. I want to go home and sleep it off. I said, you drank quite a bit. Let's give you more time to sober up. Make sure you're steady so that you don't fall and hurt yourself. He got out of bed, stood within inches of me, and said, Doc, I'm fine. I want to leave. Put a crashing patient in front of me, and I know exactly what to do. Give me an intoxicated patient who insists on going home, and I want to run and hide. On what basis could I keep him against his will? The last patient I did that to required six security guards, five milligrams of Haldol, two milligrams of Ativan, and a dislocated shoulder later, we were able to subdue him. But that patient was psychotic. He had written a note describing demons imploring him to kill his wife and turn the gun on himself. John was intoxicated and maybe even depressed, but there was no evidence that he was suicidal. Neither was he psychotic or a danger to others. The thought of letting him go to free up a precious ER bed when there were 30 patients in the waiting room was too enticing to pass up. So I asked Sherry to have our social worker give him some resources for alcohol treatment and arrange a safe way for him to get home. Later that evening, I was eating at a restaurant with my wife and some friends. My phone rang. It was Sherry from the hospital. I left the table and walked outside. Sherry said, remember the drunk guy earlier today? The social worker gave him a taxi voucher 
and called a lift to get him home. When he got home, he went to his balcony and jumped. My superpower as a physician has been my ability to compartmentalize. Give me a patient and I can separate the problem from the person. It's easier to focus on resuscitating a failing heart if you're unburdened with the knowledge that it's someone's husband. It makes it possible to move on to the next patient when it's just a dead body you failed to revive and not a two-year-old boy who drowned. It's also a survival technique, a wall to separate my professional and personal life. My wife gets really annoyed when I give her the same response every time she asks how my day at work went. It's fine, I'd say. It's fine until a young man dies and the wall cracks under the weight of accountability. When Sherry told me that he left behind a young daughter, the wall crumbled on a physician and a father of two little girls. It unleashed something curious inside my brain, a primal imperative that best separates homo sapiens from the rest of the animal kingdom. My brain started telling stories. It wove narratives about a doctor who was so incompetent that he caused the death of one of his patients a courtroom drama played out in my head where an inner voice a la Perry Mason peppered me with questions like, why did you let him leave? Why didn't you know he was lying about his depression and suicidality? You've sniffed out many lies before. Remember the father who said his son fell out of the crib? You didn't believe him. He didn't look you in the eye. You suspected child abuse. You ordered more x-rays than was warranted for a simple fall. It showed multiple broken bones in various stages of healing. You called Child Protective Services and spared the kid further trauma. Or the time the teenage girls were up and down, she had never had sex. You didn't believe her. You ordered a pregnancy test and an ultrasound, which caught a ruptured ectopic pregnancy threatened to drain the life right out of her. Where was your famed lie detector when this young man needed it the most? The pain in his eyes and the monotone of his voice were all the clues you needed. You believed him out of expediency, just to justify moving on to the next patient. If you had doubts, why didn't you call his girlfriend? The verdict was the same in every iteration of this drama guilty as charged. Instead of sleeping, my brain tossed and turned inside the crib of my skull and told tales of a young girl who lost her father to suicide. I didn't know her age, so sometimes in these stories, she was six years old. Other times, she was nine. In more forgiving moments, she was two and had no recollection of her dead father at all. She could have grown up to be a scientist, an English teacher, a mother of two, or all of the above, but instead, she grows up rudderless and rebellious. We all know what happens to girls who grow up without a father figure, right? They're just as likely to be on the front page of the newspaper as they are on the back page of the obituaries, right? When I wasn't sad or guilt-ridden, I was angry. How could someone be so selfish as to take their own life with a daughter to care for? All he had to do was tell me he was suicidal. My anger turned towards my profession, a healthcare system crushed under the toll of packed ERs in an epidemic of depression and anxiety. Profits for health insurers and drug companies surge while mental health resources continue to decline. I didn't want to go to work. When I was at work, I didn't want to take care of any patients. I especially avoided the drunk ones, hoping one of my colleagues would care for them instead. I have friends who left emergency medicine burned and disillusioned. Maybe I should leave too, 
transition to a slower paced, lower acuity urgent care instead. Or I can ditch medicine altogether and drive an Uber for a living. Less responsibility, but it still wouldn't solve the problem of staying away from drunks. <laughs> my wife knew that I was troubled. She encouraged my friends and colleagues to talk to me. They all said the same thing. They would have let him leave too. A person intent on killing themselves will eventually find a way to kill themselves. That patients like him are walking landmines. But these narratives were no match for the stories my brain was telling me. I think about him standing on his balcony, held hostage by the kind of torment that can only paint the future in black, to where the only escape lay on the cold, hard concrete three stories below his balcony. And then I remember back him remember him back in the ER telling me, Doc, I'm fine. The saying goes, you don't know the roof is leaking unless you're inside the house. Perhaps my biggest failure was not being the kind of a physician he wanted to invite inside. Several weeks after his suicide, I was driving to work when my hands started shaking. I parked and sat in my car alone. It was a cry only the dead could hear, the kind that inflamed the whites of my eyes, the kind that came packaged in tears, the shape of my pain, tears that if I didn't wipe away with the back of my hand, would splash on the floor and the whole world would hear my guilt. So I did what tortured souls do when confronted with darkness. I wrote a poem. The words bled from my pen as a kind of peace offering to the dead. More than anything, writing helped to slow down a brain that was spitting out stories like Robin Williams high on coke. To confront a tragedy and find a way to look beyond its sharp teeth and dark recesses. Because a story about an incompetent ER doctor can also be a story about a good person who made a mistake. A story about a little girl who loses her father can also be a story about resilience. A story about a broken physician can also be a story about forgiveness. He's not a ghost that haunts me, but sometimes I can smell him on the breath of a drunk person. I can hear him in the silence of someone struggling with depression. I can see him on the face of a father hugging his daughter. When I see patients like him in the ER, the wall that separates the problem from the person rests on a softer foundation. When my brain tells me another story, I think about walking my daughters to school and how holding their hands feels like a gift. And then I tell myself, it's fine. It's fine. Jay Vu, ladies and gentlemen, Jay Vu.